So we would uh, kind of do the starting out with the book of Genesis, uh, a disservice without talking about creation. So that's what we're going to talk about this morning. But I hope that this will be uh, a help to you and kind of look at it in a way that really helps um, us today in today's society. Would you agree that Satan is attacking our nation? He's attacking the world. Okay, I, I think we all agree with that. Satan has waged war against mankind in general. He's waged war uh, even more so against the believer, uh, those who trust in Jesus Christ, and he's done so by way of sin. Sin is his uh, number one weapon. Satan has crept into our nation, a nation who on uh, the day when we were uh, writing up documents and drawing up ideas of what our nation should look like, it was written and founded upon the Word of God and principles found in the Word of God, and our currency is stamped in God we trust, but uh, uh, that's become more of just a token than it really has been uh, an actual lived out in our lives, right? So Satan has waged war on mankind. He's waged war on our nation. He's done so against believers, and he's crept into our nation by attacking the church. But Satan has crept into the church by attacking the home, and he's a crept into the home by attacking individual people. Satan knows that he can destroy the entire... What is his main goal? Satan knows he's fighting a losing battle. He knows that the end result has already been decided. But he's a poor loser. He's going to do everything he can to bring as many people to his end destination, which is the lake of fire with him. And he knows that he can defeat the world. He can destroy the entire world by destroying entire nations, by destroying churches, by destroying homes, by destroying individual people. How? How is that possible? If Satan can, you say, it doesn't seem like if God could just, or if Satan, excuse me, could, could get me to, to be confused or to question things that he could destroy an entire nation. That seems a little bit, you know, it seems a little bit extra. Just, just calm down. If Satan can get you to be discontent with who you are and who God made you to be, he can also get you to be discontented with your identity, with your responsibilities, in your home, in your church, and in your country. Therefore, we must have a solid understanding of who we are and who God made us to be. This message is so simple. When I, I was telling Brother Kurt, I said, in comparison, we are preaching or teaching two totally different uh, messages today. You have this look into the book of Daniel and prophecy and dreams and all these things, what these things mean and how, how the visions that were given to, to Nebuchadnezzar and Daniel, how they were played out throughout the course of nation, uh, nation's histories. And then I said, my message is very basic, very simple, but... The simple, elementary, uh, almost seeming, uh, principles, it's on these elementary principles that the boulders of our faith are placed upon. And if we don't have these basic things down, then everything else is going to uh, crumble. So, very basic outline today, but we're going to build one upon the other. First of all, we see that God created you. God created you. I don't want you to take my word for it. Genesis chapter 1 verse 27, so God created man. That's pretty straightforward, is it not? If you believe the word of God is the Bible, if you believe that it's true, if you believe every word, then you believe that God created man. God created us unique. He created us special. He created us perfect in his eyes. Not perfect as in sinless, because we, we are very full of sin, at least I'm speaking uh, on my own behalf. But he made us, he made me exactly the way that he wanted me to be. Psalm 137, verse 14, I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works. I am a work of God, and marvelous are his works, and that my soul knoweth right well. I looked up just a few uh, facts about the human body. Uh, the human body is an unbelievable feat of engineering that no one has ever been able to uh, reproduce. Did you know that your femur, your, 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 leg, your leg bone, the biggest bone in your body, is, can support over 30 times your actual physical body's weight? 
and that ounce for ounce, your femur is stronger than steel. Did you know that if you were to uncoil your DNA, that it would stretch over 10, bil 10 billion miles long? Long enough, if you were to take your DNA and stretch it out end for end, it would reach to Pluto and back. Did you know that the human body is an unbelievable, unbelievable feat of creation that only God uh, creating it could be explained? The brain contains, now some people is give or take, but the brain contains 86 billion cells connected by over 100 trillion nerve connectors. Now, when you're a teenage boy, those connections have not fully connected yet, but they're there, and you're, you're hoping that at some point they will all come together, and at least a few of them will, will start to make connections. How many is that? Over 100 trillion nerve connections, that's more than the stars in the Milky Way galaxy. By 70 years old, you will drink over 12,000 gallons of water. Now, whether that water has been run through coffee grounds or not is up to be argued, but... Yeah, that's a lot of water. In a lifetime, you will produce over 25,000 quarts of saliva. That's enough to fill two swimming pools. That's a lot of... Uh, so if you were to wring out your pillow every night, you could fill two swimming pools over the course of your life. This one is, is crazy, but it, it's uh, true. Everyone may very little. In your lifetime, your body will process around 100,000 pounds of food. If you take 365 uh, times three, generally everyone eats about a pound of food and water, at least at a meal. At least I, I know I, I do my pound for sure. Times 80, you're, you're pushing 100,000 pounds. The eye can distinguish over 10 million distinct colors, and your body is comprised of over 35 trillion cells. It takes less faith to believe in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth than it does to believe that nothing times nobody equals everything. If you believe the Bible and you believe the word of God is true, then you just simply say, hey, I don't know how it all works, and that's okay, but I believe that God created me. I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. So first of all, we see that God created me. God created you. Number two, we see that God created you in his image. Let's look at our text verse again. So God created man in his own image, in the image of God, created he him. Oh boy, there's some, there's some pronouns. We already know this is going to get uh, unpopular really quick. I don't know that this is referring to the image, talking about the image of God's physical body. If you were to flip over to John chapter 4, in fact, let's do that. John chapter 4, verse 24. John chapter 4, verses 24. We're talking about the fact that God created you. God created you in his image. John chapter 4, verse 24. God is a spirit, capital S, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit, and in truth. Just a little tangent here. We, we talked about worship, uh, I think back in, in August, we were talking about it. Worship is simply the way that we take, the, uh, worship is a gift from God, a goodness that we're able to reflect back to him. That can be in many different ways in the way that we live our lives as offering it as a living sacrifice in praising him in thanking him and singing to him. So many ways that we can worship God. But notice that God does not leave worship open to our interpretation. We say, well, I like to worship God. God says, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. The only way that we are able to worship God in a way that pleases him is when we worship him the way that pleases him. So we can't say, well, I'm going to do this and such, and this is my worship to God. If that doesn't fit under the the guidelines of what God accepts as worship, then you can do those things, but it's not worshipful to him. God is never going to ask us to do something in worship or in our lives that go against Bible principles. That's just a little tangent there, but be careful that as you worship God, you say, well, 
This and such is my worship. Well, I worship God at home. I don't have to go to church. But God calls us to come together as the, as the united body. And, and if he asks us to do something and to worship him in that way, then we have to worship him in that way through our spirit because God is a spirit. And those that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Well, what is truth? Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Okay, that was just a little free commercial. In his image... I believe uh, more accurately talking about a trinity. We know that God is a trinity. God the Father, God the Son, Jesus, God the Holy Spirit. We, as humans, are a trinity, correct? We have a body, we have a soul, and we have a spirit. Actually, the, the one thing that we do share in common with God is the fact that we have a spirit. We're able to worship him in spirit. Also, not only are we created in his image as in we are a trinity, but also we are a, we are created in his image in that we are uh, eternal beings. God is eternal. God always has been, always was, always will be. We haven't always been, but we are and now we always will be. God is like a line. If you uh, are a, a geometry uh, major, you know that a line uh, has no beginning or end points. If you were able to draw a line on a chalkboard, as we teach in geometry, if the chalkboard is long enough, a line has no ending. It has an arrow on either end. It has no beginning origin, and it has no ending point. A line is eternal. That is what God is like. He has no origin. He has no ending. We are like a ray. We have a beginning point, but we have no end point. Our life goes on forever, and when you die, you will spend eternity in heaven or hell. That is a fact. That's what the Word of God teach us. So we are eternal beings uh, like God. So we're created in his image and that we're a trinity and in that we are eternal beings. Number three, God created me. God created me in his image. Now it's going to get really unpopular. God created male and female. Amen. Genesis chapter 1 verse 27. So God created man in his own image and the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. There are only two genders, and that's how God designed it. If there was something else in the word of God that taught otherwise, I would preach otherwise, and I would have no problem doing so. But if we are going to say that the Bible is true and our final authority, then we have to understand through scripture that male and female is the beginning and end of any and all genders. I want to try to illustrate it this way. The way that I feel about that doesn't change the way that that is, all right? Because we know that some people feel differently about that. But it doesn't change the fact. This is a microphone, right? How I feel about this microphone doesn't change the fact that it's a microphone. How uh, any, any desires that I have for this microphone doesn't change the fact that it's a microphone. And what I want to do to this microphone doesn't change the fact that it's a microphone. Let me illustrate this. What if I, my emotions tell me, well, I don't want this to be a microphone. I want it to be a guitar. Well, that's fine. I, I can want this to be a guitar all I want. It's not going to make very beautiful music. And uh, I could try to put some strings on it. But the fact of the matter is, at the end of the day, this is a, a microphone. My desires, well, I really, I really want this. In fact, I need this to be a microphone. One of the kids jumped on and broke my guitar, and I got no way to play. Uh, for, for, so I, I, I desire for this to be a microphone, it, or a, a guitar, excuse me. It doesn't change the fact that it's a microphone. What I do to this microphone doesn't change the fact that it's a microphone. I could put strings on it, or what if I were to do this? seems pretty silly, right? Okay, now let's say this, and I'll use myself as an example. I'm a man, okay? How I feel about the fact that I'm a man doesn't change the fact that I'm a man. My desires about being a man say, well, I really, I really wish that I was a woman. I don't at all. I am very glad that I'm a man, and I will, I will, well, we'll stay with that. Does, even if I wanted to be a woman uh, the, in the worst way, my desire doesn't change the fact that God created me a man. What I do to myself doesn't change the fact that I'm a man. 
If emotions and desires and actions could change the facts, we would be in trouble, would we not? Emotions are the shallowest part of our being. They're fickle. We feel one way one day, we feel another way another day. Aren't you glad that emotions and desires and our actions don't change the facts of who God is and change the fact of his word and change the fact of salvation? Because what if one day I felt like God wasn't trustworthy? Do my emotions about God change who he is? Emotions are the shallowest part of man. Faith is the deepest work of God. God doesn't do his deepest work in the shallowest parts. No matter how I feel about God, it doesn't change the fact that he is trustworthy, that he's faithful, that he's true. My desire about God, say, boy, I really wish God would, fill in the blank, doesn't change who he is. The same goes with gender. Well, I really want to be something else, or I really feel as though I am something else, or in fact, I'm going to take matters into my own hands. I'm going to change things to where I am something else. Doesn't change the fact of who you are. These are such basic principles, but yet do you see how when we go away from the basic principles, we can confuse such a very simple basic thing. God created me. He created me in his own image. He created male and female. Number four, God created man and woman to be together. Now we're going to flip over to Genesis chapter 2, verse 18. Genesis chapter 2, verse 18. And the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him and help meet for him. I can picture maybe God was just tired of watching Adam spend the first part of his morning looking for his keys in his wallet before he went to the garden and he thought, I got to get this guy some help. He can't keep his head screwed on straight. Uh, he's never going to name all the animals if he can't even keep track of the book. He's lost it three times and had to start over. Uh, we need to get him some help. I say that in jest, but God looked down and said, this is not good. It's not good that man should be alone. So he created him. Uh, help me. I'll tell the joke quickly, but it's been said, God went to Adam and he said, Adam, I have a proposal for you. What if I were to get you somebody to help you? Uh, that could uh, uh, to be a help me to you. And Adam said, well, will we describe her a little bit? He said, well, she's going to be awesome. She's going to be beautiful. She's going to love you. She is going to just say wonderful things about you every day. He said, mm, tell me more. He said, she is going to cook for you. And she'll take care of the house for you. And she will, when you have children, she'll take care of the children for you. And she'll teach them. When, when you come home, you're going to have a spot ready on the couch with just a plate of steaming food ready and a cup of coffee. And it's just, you're going to have a great relationship. You're going to do things together. It's going to be so wonderful. Adam said, wow, that sounds awesome. What's it going to cost me? And God said, well, Adam is going to cost you an arm and a leg. He said, well, what can I get for a rib? <laughs> God looked down and said, it's not good that man should be alone. I put some of the men in an uncomfortable position. I'm sorry. Uh, you've got to sit there with the elbow the rest of the, the message. It's all right. Uh, God made a helpmeet for Adam, and it was Eve. God did not create man to be with another man. The Bible says it is not good that man, man should be alone, and then he created Eve. If, if he would have wanted something else, I, I think he would have done that, right? God has the ability to create whatever he wants. He was starting with a blank canvas, so he gave Adam exactly what he needed. If he would have wanted him to be with an animal, there was already any number of animals there that, that could have worked. But God then didn't create another man. God created Eve. God did not make a man to be with a man. He didn't make a woman to be with a woman. He didn't make a man to be with an animal. He didn't make a woman to be with an animal. He didn't make a man to be with a child. He didn't make a woman to be with a child. If you, if you look, now we have something called minor attracted adults. It's not pedophilia. It's not sin. It's just called a minor attracted adult that I looked it up on Google this morning. That says it is a disease that is currently illegal. 
But what happens is we live in a society that wants to change the name of sin rather than just calling sin, sin. In fact, the only sin in our society today, seemingly, is to call sin, sin. It's not an alternate lifestyle. It's sin. It's not love. It's sin. It's not bestiality or, oh, well, I identify as a furry. It's sin. God created man to be with a woman, a woman to be with a man, and that's it. Number five, we see that finding a wife or finding a husband is a good thing. Flip over to Proverbs chapter 18, verse 22. 18, verse 22 of Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 18, verse 22. Whoso findeth a wife findeth a good thing and obtaineth favor of the Lord. And I am a testimony to that. I found a wife, I found a great wife, and she's a good thing. And I believe because of that I have obtained favor uh, of the Lord. And all of you could uh, testify of that with your spouse, your husband, your wife. You, when you find a wife, when you find a husband, you find a good thing. That's the way that God designed it. Inside of God's plan, marriage is a beautiful thing, and it works great. God designed, number six, God designed man and woman to be an independent family. Genesis, we're going to go back to Genesis chapter 2 now. We're, we're wrapping up here. Genesis chapter 2, verse 24. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. Therefore shall a man leave his father. That word leave is interesting. In the Greek it means to leave. It means to leave. It means to go away. When you get married, you become an independent family. That's the way that God designed it. It means to cutteth the umbilical cordeth, and to be your own manneth, and to man up and be a wife, or to be a, a husband to your wife and a, a wife to your husband, and to live independently. Mom and dad don't have a say, or at least shouldn't have a full veto say of what happens in the home, because God created Christ to be the head of the home with the man as the head of the wife, the wife as uh, sub submissively following her husband and the children under that. That's the way that God planned it and designed it. We say, I don't like that. Take that up with God. That wasn't my idea, right? And lastly, we see that God views a married man and woman as one. God views a married man and woman. Therefore shall a man, this is Genesis 2, 4, 24, therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, shall cleave unto his wife. That word cleave means to cling or adhere to. That reminds me of what I did when I first met Kara. I thought, wow, um, this is a good thing. Uh, I don't want to mess this up. So I just followed her around. I clung to her and I thought, I'm just going to annoy her into liking me. And uh, I did. And uh, I am still currently doing that 10, 11 years later. Um, shall leave his, uh, cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. I don't know exactly how this works, but I do know that God's word is true, and I know that God views a married man and woman as one. Mark chapter 10, verse 7. Flip over there. This is red letters. This is Jesus uh, talking. And he's simply reiterating what was already said uh, in the book of Genesis. Mark chapter 10, verse 7, For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. So then they are no more twain, but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let no man put asunder. Again, it doesn't matter what our thoughts about it are when we take the marriage vow and we say, I do, and uh, he says, yes, ma'am. Then at that point forward, God views man and woman as one flesh. An illustration of this, this is the last passage I'll have you turn to, the book of Job chapter 1. The book of Job chapter 1, a very common story. We know that uh, Satan is walking about earth. He's watching things. He goes to heaven and God says, have you considered my servant Job? And, and God makes a mockery of God. In fact, Satan uh, asks God some insinuating questions. He says, does Job serve you for naught? If you were to take away all of the blessings that you've given Job and take away your hedge of protection from Job, he would curse you to your face. And God said, that's fine. You can take everything from him, just don't touch him. Notice verse 12. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that he hath is in thy power. 
only upon himself. Put not forth thine hand. What was the one thing that Job had left when everything else was taken from him? There was Job and Mrs. Job. A beautiful example of when a man and woman come together, God said, don't touch him, she was left. God views a married man and woman as one flesh. So, a very, very, very rudimentary basic message today. But if we don't have these things hammered out into our life, all of the other seemingly gray areas of the world seem more difficult to understand and say, well, yeah, what about what, I wonder if there are other genders. I wonder, if, I wonder if any of these other things. But when we realize and go back to the very beginning of the book and understand that God created man. God created man in his image. He created male and female only. He created man and woman to be together. He created the husband and a wife as a good thing and to be married together, to leave their family, to operate as an independent family, and to be one flesh. A lot of these other quote-unquote gray areas become very black and white, do they not? I just want to encourage you today. We can understand these things, and we can share these things, and we can do so without being hateful. No one's ever hated someone or argued someone to Christ. We live in a world that's, that is... is is not headed in a direction that, that is, is very pleasing uh, to me. I'm sure not pleasing to God. It's not in accordance, in accordance with the word of God. But there are a lot of people who do believe these basic things. Don't back down from these principles. Don't be ashamed or embarrassed for the fact that you believe that God created you and that he created you in his image and that he created you a man if you're a man and a woman if you're a woman and the fact that, that you don't believe that a man should be with another man and vice versa. But don't be hateful about it either. That's where often we get off and, and we're never ever going to hate someone to Christ or the two things that Jesus prayed for when he was praying to God for the believers was the love of Christ and unity. And we're never going to see the love of Christ and unity go forth if we're, we're living with a heart of hate. But we have to settle the fact that these things are true. And if we believe these things, then we can start to stack the other principles found in the Word of God upon a very solid, sure foundation. So God created man.